Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has been re-elected with 97% of the votes. Official results show Sisi secured the same uh, uh, proportion he secured four years ago for his first term. The turnout was lower this time at 41%. Sisi has been virtually guaranteed a landslide win because uh, the election featured only one other candidate, Musa Mustafa Musa, an urgent Sisi supporter. All serious opposition candidates dropped out in January, some citing intimidation. Sisi says he wanted other candidates to run and denied having a hand in opposition candidates' withdrawals. Egypt's election commission says the vote was free and fair, but the low turnout is a potential setback for Sisi, who suggested before the vote that he saw it as a referendum on his presidency rather than a genuine contest. Now, for more insight on the Egyptian elections, I'm joined by Andrew Miller, Deputy Director of the Project on the Middle East, on Middle East Democracy. Mr. Miller, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. So rather interesting, yes, 97%, but they still say it, it kind of shows a drop in the enthusiasm among Egyptians. Why so? Um, one revealing indicator is that uh, he actually received 2 million fewer votes than he did in 2014. Uh, and that's because of the lower turnout. In 2014, the turnout was about 47.5%. This time, it's a little over 41%. And despite the fact that you have more Egyptian voters in 2018 than you do in 2014, the lower turnout rate means fewer people were motivated to go to the polls and affirmatively cast a vote for Sisi endorsing a second term. Uh, rather understandable, because in the last few months, we've seen uh, the economy doing really badly, and uh, there were even protests on the streets, right? That's absolutely right. The, um, while the aggregate growth of the economy seems to be moving in the right direction, those benefits are not being widely shared across the population. And major indicators like inflation have been through the roof. Unemployment remains unsustainably high. There's a great deal of discontent with the economic situation. Yeah. Now, over the time since I actually came to power, there have been accusations of human rights violations. But it seems like the Western allies, even regional allies, have been very silent over these violations. Why is that the case in your assessment? I think um, it's because of perceived strategic benefits associated with um, uh, a good relationship with the Egyptian government. So notwithstanding the human rights violations that take, as in other places in the world, uh, the United States, European countries are prioritizing security cooperation, a cooperation on migration, which is obviously a major issue for, for the Europeans, over um, concerns about uh, freedom of speech, freedoms of expression, uh, uh, democratic values. Uh, it, it's not a unique uh, case, um, but nevertheless, it's one that reveals the priorities of Western mm -hmm. governments. In fact, uh, did you find it rather curious that the U.S. Embassy in Cairo uh, tweeted that it was impressed by the enthusiasm and the patriotism of the Egyptian voters? Yes, I mean, that was a particularly ill, you know, ill-timed and ill-designed tweet. Uh, you know, while it's understandable that U.S. embassies do not want to create problems with uh, foreign governments, their host governments, under certain instances, it's quite another thing to misrepresent what's taking place within the country. And I think it's hard to argue that that tweet did anything else other than that. Yeah. Now, given that uh, it looks like uh, Sisi is enjoying a good place with the Western allies, uh, and even the regional, uh, you know, powers, whether it is uh, Saudi Arabia, where mm -hmm. the King uh, Salman um, actually did express support for him. Mm -hmm. uh, does it make it easier for him forging forward in that he doesn't have to worry so much about what he's doing? I think the absence of an international response, a critical international response, does provide a more room for maneuver. It's one less thing to be concerned about. Um, if there were sustained pressure from important uh, Western allies from the United States, from the United Kingdom, Germany, France, I think um, it would create uh, more difficulties for his situation. In the absence of that, he has more um, space to address the domestic environment the way he wants, but ultimately it's his management of domestic affairs that's going to determine his longevity and power, not necessarily his ability to uh, retain support from international members. And very quickly, what are some of the challenges do you think Egyptians uh, may face in the coming years? 
I think it's going to be very difficult to, um, to um, uh, propagate any economic benefits to a wider swath of the population. We've seen Egypt undertake uh, austerity measures in previous, under previous presidents, including Mubarak in the 2000s. But as we've seen now, it's very difficult to ensure that that benefit is actually benefiting the poorest Egyptians, who are an overwhelming percentage. Additionally, you have concerns about security. Um, you have an ongoing insurgency in the Sinai. And there is a risk it's conspiracy spread to more populated areas. So I think on wow. the economic and security front, there are reasons for Egyptians to be less than fully comfortable. I want to thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Insights with us. Yes. Uh, well, that's uh, Andrew Miller, who is the deputy director of the Project on Middle East Democracy.